Oh, sure, there are emotions, and I don't deny that, and I'm not even saying there's something wrong with emotion. I prefer to feel profoundly. I prefer to think powerfully. But it's very clear to me that most of the feelings I have, I don't have. The feelings have me. Most of the thoughts I think, I don't think. The thoughts think themselves. They think me, so to speak. As a matter of fact, they think about me. I have these thoughts about myself and about the relationship and about the other person. I say, but if I examine it very carefully, something is thinking me and the other person in the relationship. See, you and I have already answered the question, what is relationship? What is being related? If I ask you to come up to the microphone and share, if I ask you to call in from Australia or New York or Houston, if I ask you to call in and tell me what is this being related stuff, we all have an answer for it. It may not be fully formed, that is to say fully articulated, but we've all got an answer about what relationship is, and I'm asking you to begin to question that that is to say, to question what is relationship, what is being related, like to open up a new domain of possibility called relationship like a question, like a possibility. See, everybody knows what love is. You feel good. Love is a set of feelings. It's a mood, isn't it? Love's a mood. We know. We've been there. We've been in love. I invite you to entertain the possibility that love is not an experience at all. Not that it doesn't show up in our experience, but that the source of love is not our experience. And if it isn't, what is it? See, I want to invite you to consider the possibility that love is a word. Well, it is anyhow. You don't have to work too hard at that. We can tell that love's a word. And when we're talking about love, we're using the word love to represent some phenomenon out there. Some thing. See, there's a thing called love and a word which represents it. I'm inviting you to consider the possibility that love starts out when it's other than a reaction, when it's a creative act, which I assert that true love must be. When love is a creative act, it starts out as a word in the form of a declaration that literally one is creating love in the declaration, I love you. One is not talking about some internal state when one says, I love you. I'm asking you to consider that as a possibility. And I'm using that particular possibility to examine with you that domain of love as a clearing, as a possibility, as an opening, as a question. I want you to see that in the moment of declaring your love for someone, you are not speaking about some internal state which you are representing with the word love, but rather in the declaration, in the declaration, I love you, there is created, brought forth in that moment, by declaration, love as a clearing, as a possibility. interesting notion, because for the most part, we never kind of, you know, that's just 
Look, you're going to tell me that love's just a word? No, it's some deep, profound feeling. It's something in my heart. If you get a chance, you should go to the hospital and sit in on a heart operation. It'll disabuse you of the notion that people have love in their hearts. So I'm saying this very silly thing. I'm saying that love is a word. Not like a word which represents an internal state, something in your heart or your soul or your mind or your feelings or your experience. But that love is a word like a declaration, like a stand you take for someone or something. A stand you take for someone, towards someone. Rather than it's being an internal state which you represent with the word love. If that were true, if just that little bit were true, the distance between you and the mastery of love would be very short. You and I could bring forth the phenomenon of love by virtue of a declaration, I love you. Where the declaration was a stand a commitment, and we could see that that was not something called love, but an opening, a possibility, a clearing in which our experiences could show up as an expression of the declaration, as an expression of the stand, as an expression of the commitment, as an expression of the context If all that were really possible, then the distance between us and mastering love is pretty short. You see, what shows up in a stand validates the stand. So if a doubt shows up, in the space of something for which you stand, it shows up as an expression of the stand. That is to say, it shows up for you as something to handle out of your stand, not as something contrary to to that for which you stand. So if love in our relationships was a clearing in which life became present. I want you to see that even what we ordinarily think of as a negative circumstance in a clearing created by a declaration of love, where the declaration is something for which you stand, even a so-called negative circumstance does not show up in opposition to that for which you stand, but shows up as something to be handled within the stand. Now, I know you're sitting there, lots of you saying, gee, I wish it were that easy. But I'm saying it might be something very close to that easy. Just like that. And I'm inviting you into this domain of possibility where you don't know the answers, where relationship and love exists like a question. See, I know you think 
that love is a set of emotions and moods and thoughts and attitudes and outlooks and feelings. And I'm inviting you to consider the possibility that that simply is one interpretation, not one with which you are stuck that you do not need to live the rest of your life without love when you don't have that set of feelings which you have heretofore described as love. That it might be possible to bring love into your life like a creation, like something for which you could be responsible, like something you could bring forth on your own, as a matter of declaration and as a matter of taking a stand. And that you could bring love into those circumstances in your life when the relationships are most difficult, most problematic. And that you could do it as a simple act of being, where being is that for which you are willing to stand. And that the stand comes forth in a declaration and exists behind the declaration as a stand. We're pretty stuck on this notion that love is an experience. We're pretty convinced about that, pretty committed to that. And I'm inviting you to break that notion up. You see, maybe... Being loved is something for which you have to have the courage to stand. Maybe a whole lot of the mischief in our relationships is that we're unwilling to take the stand that we are loved. We're willing to think about it. Am I? Am I not? Does she? Does she not? She did this. That must mean that. But she did that. That must mean this. And back and forth and up and down and all around. And you know, those things will continue to happen, I can promise you. He will forget the call. <laughs> I always like those laughs of recognition. <laughs> he will read the newspaper when you want to talk. She will be distracted. If you can't live with that, you're in real trouble. You see, really, a great deal of it is our power to live with the ordinary things in life, like the things I've just mentioned. My son called me the other day. I have two sons, so you won't know which one it is, you see. And he wanted to talk about something that was going on for him in his relationship. Maybe open up a little room for himself by discussing it. And he told me this thing that happened in his relationship. And then he told me how terrible it was that this thing had happened in his relationship. Just how awful it was for him. You know, he was experiencing a little bit of jealousy in his relationship. Now, you we know, that never happens in your relationship. Just my son has that in his relationship. I mean, jealousy, we all know, is something that shouldn't happen. 
That's like a question, how stupid can you get? <laughs> if you think jealousy isn't going to happen in your relationships, I want to get into a poker game with you. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that it will happen like a, it's necessary. I'm just saying that if you're running around thinking that it won't happen or hoping that it won't happen, you're being silly because being jealous is a part of being related, at least for most people, some of the time. Not for all people, all, not for any of us all the time, and not for all of us some of the time, but for most of us some of the time. And you know, there's not much you can do about it. It's a subject about which I was very interested for a long time because I noticed it came up a lot in the work that I was doing with people. People often talked about the problem of jealousy in their relationships. It's a very big issue for people. What I finally discovered is that being human and being related includes being jealous. And it's not the jealousy that makes a problem in the relationship. It's your reaction to the jealousy, the way in which you hold the jealousy. I mean, jealousy is never pleasant. I'm not trying to make cotton candy out of jealousy. This is not Pollyanna or positive thinking. Jealousy is nasty stuff. And to some degree, it's inevitable in any relationship. And the power it has in your relationship is the power you give to it. See, you can't do much about the reaction, but you can do something about your reaction to the reaction. You can determine your own response to the jealousy even though you can't determine whether you're jealous or not. So we've got this thing called relationship like an object, like a thing, like a something. And I'm asking us tonight to work on the possibility of relationship like a distinction, like a clearing like an opening, like a particular kind of clearing, like a particular kind of opening, an opening in which life can show up. You see, I don't think what you think about relating makes any difference. And I don't think what you feel about relating makes any difference. So if you change the way you thought about relating tonight, I say it wouldn't make any difference in your life. If you change the way you feel about being related, about relating tonight, I don't think it will make any difference in your life. The question at which I want to get, sorry, the issue at which I want to get tonight is who are you that relationship is? Not what do you think relationship is, or what do you feel relationship is, or what's your opinion about relationship, or what do you know about relationship, but who are you that relationship is? Now, I know that's very difficult to follow. So I'll take a couple minutes with that. So we never stop to think that we are, that certain things are doesn't even make sense in English. Doesn't make, doesn't mean that it's not valid, that it doesn't make sense. If I told you the theory of relativity, that wouldn't make sense either. And it's valid. 
See, it's not so much that I want to get at what you think or what you believe about relationship, but what are you being that relationship is? If you and I could alter who we are, that relationship is, I assert that that would make a profound difference in our lives. Whereas changing our thinking and changing our beliefs won't make any difference at all in the quality of our relationship. You know, if you find a new recipe for relating, it's like making a New Year's resolution. In that realm, you and I already know more than we're able to put to use. You know, you know you ought to be doing certain things you do. I know that I ought to be doing certain things I don't do. See, there's no power in the recipe. There's no power in the prescription. There's no power in changing your thinking or changing what you believe. There's no power in changing the way you feel. But if there's a fundamental shift in who you are, that relationship is. See, relationship is a certain kind of possibility in your life. And the possibility which it is is a function of who you are, not of what you think or believe or know or the rules or prescriptions you've got about relating. So that brings me to the very heart, the very center of what this evening is about for me. A shift in who I am, that relationship is. A shift in my being, that relationship is. And I'm inviting you to be here, not to get some new information and not to be entertained and not to have a good time, and it's okay with me if you do, but really to be here out of a commitment to shift who you are that relationship is, who you are that love is. Now part of the question that will come up in most people's minds is what do I have to do to do that? You have to be here. You have to be here with a commitment. You have to be here playing, engaged. See, I know that some of you are trying to figure out whether I'm a good public speaker or not. That's like a quarterback on the practice field trying to figure out whether the coach understands the game of football. If you and I can be here with a commitment together to alter who we are, I promise that being here, that out of being here, who we are, that relationship and love is, will have been transformed. I don't mean different, because different would be related to what we were when we came in. But I mean transformed at a whole new possibility called relationship and love will have been created, a possibility into which we can grow and into which we can experiment and into which we can evolve. So I expect us to leave here tonight with nothing but a space of possibility. Not with something to add to what we've already got, but a new opening, a new possibility, a new clearing in which we can move, in which we can experiment, in which we can begin to express ourselves, in which we can learn. One of the things that I've been, dis been discovering about relationship is a very simple and obvious thing once you see it. Could be said that relationship is a clearing in which love shows up. Sorry, a relationship is a clearing in which love can show up. And love is a very fundamental part of us. Back in the very beginning when we first started all this work, back in like 72, when we trained people to lead our seminars, 
We had a very kind of exhaustive training program. It was exhausting as well. We would give people an opportunity to share themselves until they had really gotten down to the most fundamental expression of themselves and they felt complete and whole and empty and open and just there. You know, and in the beginning, the first thing that people would say was all the stuff they thought they were interested in and all the stuff that they liked and all their dreams and hopes and so on and so forth. You know, all that stuff you and I created in order to look good, that was what would come up first. And then as you start to unburden that, as you start to get that off, then comes up the kind of stuff that people don't like about themselves. So first you get what you'd like people to think about you. Then you get what you hope people don't notice about you. And you can begin to see that as people let go of that, as people let that out, as people share that, they don't get better, they get a little worse. Because then they start to get down to the stuff they can't tell. The stuff they cannot say, they can't do it, no, no. You know, the stuff you've never told anybody. And you'd die if anybody found out. You think that that's really down at the bottom of yourself. That's your deepest, darkest secret. Well, after you begin to share that, it gets to be like spaghetti. You know, okay, so you did. All right.